It is good to have you all here this morning. Um, good morning to everyone online. It is awesome to worship with you all. Um, a couple of reminders. If you are traveling through the building, please wear your mask. Um, also, if you are singing, please make sure it is on as we don't want to spit on the people in front of you. You are welcome. <laughs> Um, for those of you still watching at home, you do not have to call in to come to church. We are limiting seating as we can still be social distanced. Um, I think that's all the announcements this morning. So let's go to God in prayer. Please bow with me. Awesome God, thank you for this morning and the opportunity to worship in your house. Thank you for the people who are gathered and those who are watching online. All the families that are represented here this morning, God, we, we lift them up to you. And we ask that your spirit pour over us so that we can hear your word in our lives and carry that out to your people. Please center us as we listen to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would like to stand for our opening song.
Let us turn our hearts to God in worship as we join together in the call to worship. Just a reminder that when we speak, we say the words because we mean them and we know the power that is held within the words because that's the word of creation that God created us with. And so let us join together. Let us, or, sorry, <clears throat> help us to remember, O oh God, some, some of, of what, what we, we have, have tried, tried to, to forget. Learn. When we fall sh fell short, when, when we, we fail, fail to, to follow, follow your call. call. Remind us that you fix the broken. You, you can, can and have healed our failures all together and, and brought, brought each of us here. here. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Your grace is more Where grace is found Is where you are And where you are Lord, I am free Holiness is Christ in me Oh God, how I need 
righteousness, O oh God, how I need you. I whispered. You may be seated. We're going to invite the children for the children's moment to stand in their chair, like, like Mike here is, right? But yours doesn't have wheels, so it's okay. So go ahead. It's okay to stand up in your chair so you can be seen. Because let's be honest, when we were kids, we all wanted to stand up in our seat, didn't we? Come on. It's Monday night. We're at the Republic Ballpark, field number five. The game's almost over. Two outs, runner on third. You're up to bat. All you have to do is get a base hit. The runner on third comes home. Game's over. You win. You're a hero. You walk up to the plate. Oh, no. You struck out again. The game's over. Your team lost again. Hartland loved to cook. He learned to cook because he helped his mom take care of his brothers and sisters while she worked. He especially liked to cook fried chicken. And he even had a special recipe with 11 herbs and spices. Now, Harlan didn't have enough money to open a restaurant of his own, but he decided that if he could sell his recipe to other restaurants, that those people could use his special secret recipe and sell kind of his chicken to their customers. Well, Harlan knocked on a thousand doors, over a thousand doors, but no one was interested in his secret recipe with 11 herbs and spices. All he heard were the words, no thanks. The only thing that Walt ever wanted to do in his life was to draw cartoons, make them come to life, and make kids smile. Well, he started a cartoon business, but he ran out of money, and so he had to close it down. Well, then he created a character called Oswald. But somebody stole his idea, so that didn't work out either. Well, he decided if he couldn't make cartoons and he couldn't make movies, maybe he would be in a movie. But he was really kind of terrible at acting, so that didn't work out real good either. Well, the Bible tells us of a man named John Mark. He traveled with Barnabas and Paul, traveled all around telling people about Jesus. Well, one day he decided he just didn't want to do that anymore. And we don't really know why he didn't want to do that. Maybe he missed his family. Maybe he was homesick. Maybe he was tired. Maybe he really was sick. Or maybe he just decided that telling people about Jesus was harder than he thought it was going to be. Whatever the reason, he just quit and went home. Now, if those four people that I just talked about had given up, had quit, had said, we're not doing this anymore, and if they had never, ever tried again, well, you know that boy or girl that struck out, they might not ever know the exciting feeling of hitting a home run. And if old Harlan hadn't knocked on one more door, we wouldn't know about Colonel Sanders, and maybe we'd have never eaten Kentucky Fried Chicken. And if Walt Disney had decided, I don't want to start over anymore. I'm tired of having to start everything over again. Well, he probably would have never created Mickey Mouse. And the worst thing of all, the very worst thing that could have ever happened, is if John Mark and his friends and Jesus' disciples decided that they didn't want to tell people about Jesus anymore. Maybe it just wasn't worth it, or maybe it just wasn't even safe out there talking about Jesus. And just imagine if they hadn't done that. We wouldn't have the church, we wouldn't have the Bible, and we surely wouldn't know how much Jesus loves us. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for today and for loving us. I thank you that you are always with us, whether we succeed 
and when we fail. Help us this week to have the courage to tell others about you and to never fail in telling others how much you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. I just have one question. Dave, did you have to do the homework and eat that chicken that came in that bucket? Uh-huh. He was all excited this week. <clears throat> uh, this morning, this is a time in which we take the opportunity to give thanks to God for what God has already given to us. An opportunity to take an accounting what goes into our lives and what we're giving back to our community and to the church and specifically to God. And normally this is the time in which we pass a plate and we talk about those kinds of things. But I, I want to take the, the moment to remind us that offering is not just about what comes out of our pockets or what goes into a plate, but rather it is also a time for us to recognize what God has given us and to take a portion of that part of our life as well. We all have time. We all have talents. We all have things to be thankful for that we can give a portion back to God. And so this morning as we go to prayer, I want you to be thinking about the things and those moments in which God has blessed you and that you can take and give a little bit more to God this week. Would you join me in prayer? We give you thanks, O oh God, for your grace that goes before us, that has loved us through each and every one of our moments, through the great and through the small, through the success and through the failure. You breathed into us your spirit and created us in your image that we might be able to be who we are in the place we are called to be. For our gifts and talents, O oh God, we give you thanks. And we offer a portion of our lives and of our time back to you. The means by which we live you have placed in our lives and so we offer a portion back, O oh God, that it might benefit another. This morning we lift up those who are hurting those who are in the hospital, those who are mourning the loss of another, those who are living in the world of chaos, those who are in the midst of war. We pray, O oh God, your presence in their lives, that you would grant them healing and hope and peace and strength. This morning, O oh God, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here, that we might Feel the tug of your Holy Spirit that you might whisper into our hearts. And when we close ourselves off to you, you might scream at us to let us know how much you love us. Remind us of what we were and what we are and what you call us to be. As we give you thanks, O oh God, for all that you have done. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Now in the church at Antioch, where there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manan, a member of the court of the Herod, the ruler of the court of Herod the ruler, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And we, we skip to um, verse 13. Then Paul and his companions set sail per, for Paphos and came to Persia in Pamphylia. John, however, left them and returned to Jerusalem. Colossians 4, 10 through 11. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, greets you. These are the ones of the circumcision among my co-workers from the kingdom of God, and they have been to comfort me. The word of God for the people of God. So we're continuing our series on here, 
the stories that brought us to this place and eventually the reminder that we're called to go from this place to where God is calling each of us and all of us as a church. And so we began by starting with stories of, well, starting, right? We have to begin at the beginning. And so uh, it's important for us to remember that God called us at a certain time. And when things get tough, we can be reminded of that calling because it gives us strength. We talked last week about how we are, we have successes. But on top of that, it's the successes that God gets us through that we weren't quite equipped for that really matter, that remind us that no matter what mountain might be ahead of us, we can climb it. And today we want to talk about, well, failure. I'll be real honest with you, this is not a suggested theme for your third sermon. In fact, they tell us for the first year, don't preach anything that could be construed as negative. And we're going on week three, just so you know. So in a year from now, I might be referring to this sermon in a failure series later. But the reason that we need to talk about failure is because we don't like to talk about failure. If I asked you to name your top 10 most successful things or happiest moments, you could probably come up with 20 and have to figure out which one fit in the top 10. When I asked you about your top 10 failures, you might get to three. But then after that, it's kind of hard to remember. Because as human beings, we don't remember the things we don't want to remember, right? We, we forget those things that, that bring us down, and we try to focus on just the positive, and so r- focusing on failure is not an easy thing to do. But focusing on failure and allowing our failure to be a part of our story is important because even our failures brought us to this particular place, and God, uh, God brought us here for a particular reason. So even the best quarterbacks and pitchers in sports are told to forget their failures as soon as it happens, right? You throw that interception uh, or or you, you, you give up that home run, you're supposed to just forget about it and focus on the next pitch. But the best of those athletes, they do forget, but they go back later and they study what it was that caused them to make that mistake. Because learning from our mistakes, well, well, it keeps us pushing forward. In this particular story, we have the, the story of John. You, you read it there. Uh, Lois mentioned John Mark, and that's the name that a lot of scriptures remind us that his name is. And you might remember John Mark from like the Waltons or something to that effect. It's a kind of an old-timey name. And the reason that John Mark has that name is because it's his two names. The first one is his Hebrew name, the name that his mom gave him, and the second is his Greek name. So he was named John, but in Greek it was Mark, and so he was often referred to as John Mark. And often in scripture it's kind of hard to nail down who they're talking about because it could be John, the other John, or the third John, there are a lot of Johns, or it could be Mark. And in this particular story we have where Paul and his followers bring along an assistant. He's not even one of the main guys. He's just the assistant, and they're going about doing what they do, uh, going from town to town and talking about Jesus. And at some point, they go to make a, a big step into this journey, which is to literally get on a boat and sail somewhere. And I, I don't know if some of us have gone on cruises, and they're really kind of nice. This is not a nice cruise. To get out into the water was to risk one's life and to put yourself in in danger, as you can see from some of the other stories in the Bible where it involves boats. And in this particular case, we have John Mark decide he's going home to his mama in Jerusalem. We don't know why, but more than likely it was because, well, the ask got a little hard, right? It's easy to volunteer for something, but man, that that next ask to go out into the sea, I don't know. So he goes home. That's it. He quits. Some of us have quit, right? We've said, I don't have the talent, or I I can't really do that, or I've, I've I've smashed my thumb enough doing this thing. I'm not really building something. I'm more injuring myself. We can come up with all the reasons why, the excuses we've given, the things we've listed. 
And I had a, a, a good one for you, and I'll, I'll bring it up later, but one this week that kind of kept calling to me was about a horse. Three years ago, I, I decided, or a couple years ago, I don't remember, two or three, uh, my youngest asked for a rocking horse. And so I thought in the line of my grandfather, I would build him a rocking horse. Doesn't that sound like a sweet thing to do? You'll think different if you ever see the rocking horse. Because it didn't rock. You would think it's easy to build a rocking horse, right? But it's not. It, it, it rocked more this way than it did this way. It didn't really do that either because eventually it was too tall and it would fall over. And eventually it fell off its feet. It wasn't wide enough. The seat didn't stay on. The mop head fell off. And the only thing that worked on it was the hole I put in the ears for the, the handle, right? And then eventually what that turned into was because I have a boy, it became a weapon that was able to be removed from the horse. I failed on every account of the horse. And in fact, the very next day after Christmas, his grandparents bought him a rocking elephant that sang music, and that became his favorite. And my horse got hid behind the door, which it should have. And after this lovely time of being out, you know, being stuck in our house for a while, we decided to clean out the closet, the, the storage room. And so the horse made a reappearance in its broken form as if it were taunting me. And lately it's been stored at the bottom of the stairs. So every time I walk down, I have to look at my shame like a dog who's made a mess, right? And I don't know if it's on purpose. I don't think it is but it felt like it was. And even worse is that I'm telling you all this story, I'm going to have to fix that stupid horse, right? Because our failures remind us that we can't quit. Our failures, even as small as a rocking horse, remind us that we're supposed to be getting better at who we are and what we do. John Mark here decides at some point, as we read in Colossians, that he's going back to the task that God has asked him to do, and he rejoins Paul in his journey to the point that Paul points him out as one of his circumcised brothers, right? Which means literally uh, the, one of the same blood. He calls him as if he were family. That Mark is someone important who has pretty much sacrificed with Paul during this journey. And Lois told you a little bit about it, but Mark is not just an assistant. He's the guy we call the gospel writer Mark. He's the guy that literally wrote the gospel that Luke, the writer of Acts, and the writer of Luke, and Matthew copied mostly from to write their own gospels. Because he didn't quit. Because he recognized when he had failed at something and he took up his mantle again and gave it another go. Those things brought us to where we are. And those stories may not be all that important. They may be a sad little horse sitting at the bottom of our stairs. And we may not think it to be an important part of our story. But then again, we can make it an amazing part of our story. So thinking through this, my only thought was, my five-year-old probably is never going to ride that horse ever again, even if I rebuild it. Though, I'll be honest with you, I made it large enough that the 12-year-old could probably ride on it. I should, probably should have had plans. But if I rebuild it, then think of the story that happens when, I don't even want to say this, but when my grandkids come over, right? Is this... Is this uh, my dad's rocking horse? Well, let me tell you a story about that boy, bad boy, right? And then those stories become stories about how we got to where we are. That God uses our brokenness and our failures to make something amazing out of them. And if we don't reflect back, we don't allow God's redemptive grace to work in our lives. We allow our failures to continue to be failures, and we stop allowing God to make something of our brokenness. Mark got back on that boat and went across that sea and he changed the world. 
And God is reminding us that we have stories in our own past that we need to resurrect and look back on and recognize that they brought us to the place we are. The story I, I didn't really talk about was that I came to this area of town, this area of the state, eight, nine years ago. I can't remember. It's been a long time. I came to start a church that didn't make it. And I, I bled and I sacrificed and I hurt for that thing. And I recognize that if I had never done that failure, I would not be here this morning. You see, all the things that happened in our past brought us to where we are. And they're all important. Because they're also taking us to where God is calling us to go. Literally, God is speaking to each and every one of us this morning. Get back up on that horse. Even if it doesn't rock, and even if it's probably going to fall over, keep getting back up on it. Because God has some place for us to be. It's here, and it takes us into our tomorrow. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, for your forgiveness that spills out into each part of our life. For when we fall short, your grace is always enough. It comes and makes us whole. Allow us this morning, O oh God, to remember the times in which we have fallen short of your calling. When we have gotten off the boat, when we have stepped away from the horse and call us back. Allow us to accept your love when our talent and our ability and our perseverance weren't sufficient. And maybe this is our first time, oh God, recognizing that we need you in our life. Send your Holy Spirit upon us that we might for the first time know the wholeness of Jesus Christ. Make us what you started in us, the things that brought us here and what will bring us to where you want us to be. Your people your church, your kingdom. Amen. Please stand if you're able and join us in our closing song, Amazing Grace. Great. 
thus far, who made us who we are and calls us to who we are to become, send us forth that we might get back in that boat and on that horse, that we might be persistent in our call, that we might be the church he wants us to be for here and now. We give you thanks for being with us and for going with us. In the name of the Christ, we go. Amen. 